Hello, welcome to Galactic Terrors, the online reading series sponsored by the New York chapter of the Horror Writers Association. I am James Chambers, and my co-host is... I'm Carol Geisander. Thank you for joining us, everyone. We Welcome back to those of you who've been here before, and to those of you just joining us for the first time tonight. Uh, we're glad that you came to Galactic Terrors, where we scour the depths of space, uncharted alien worlds, and occasionally the Lower East Side to bring you... <laughs> weird, strange, spectacular, and occasionally shady tales uh, from some of today's best authors in horror and science fiction and all sorts of cool stuff. And one of these days, I'm going to really write some kind of opening monologue uh, to go with this. <laughs> no, I like this ever so much better because it keeps me intrigued because I don't know what you're going to say. So it's great. <laughs> that makes two of us. <laughs> yes, right? Look, so, words magically appear. That's exactly. terrific. Well, uh, we know there are a lot of horror fans in the audience. We hope you all had a great Halloween. Uh, we were talking a little bit before the show about uh, the the abundance or lack of trick-or-treaters, depending on where we live, and all sorts of things about, uh, ca yep, Carol had, had one trick-or-treater, uh, but that was okay. She valiantly um, consumed all of the Halloween candy. That's uh, right. So. You know, it was buy one bag, get one free. So you can't leave with just one. So, you know, uh, I, I didn't give the full bag to that trick or treater, but there you go. That's it. Magically, it's disappeared. That would have been, it would have been the uh, happiest trick or treater ever. Yes. His yes. whole bag. Yeah. So. Now, Halloween is not a, a, a staple holiday for everybody, but one thing we'd love for you to do is put in the chat where you're where you're listening from. We already see that Wendy's listening in in Scotland, so that's really cool. So oh, let us wow. know where you are, everybody. Yeah, that's great. We'd love to hear where people are from. Um, way back when we started doing this, we uh, were in the uh, in the routine of doing live readings around New York City in various places, and it was always great to see people. And then we realized when we moved to the online uh, platform that we were connecting with people literally all around the world. And it's just been great to have readers from other countries come on and have people in the audience from other countries and just to reach so many uh, authors and readers and connect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, w within the time zone, we can reach most people, but you guys are probably aware of this. Uh, we record the shows as well, and they're available on our YouTube channel afterwards. So you can even go back and take a look at some of the other ones that we've done in the past, if you've missed any, because um, it's really fun to go back and see them. Yes, yeah, there's plenty there to uh, to catch up on. Yeah. Now, I um, I don't know, though, those of us who are very fond of Halloween may be having a little bit of Halloween withdrawal. So um, one thing that I think could help for everybody for that is to think about the fact that, you know, we could do Thanksgiving with horror. Thanksgiving is another U.S. holiday that's coming up where we commonly have a roast turkey and stuffing and all sorts of things. What do you think, Jim? How about some Thanksgiving horror? Would that work? I, I, I'm open to that. Yeah, I think there's uh, there's some opportunity there. There aren't a lot of great Thanksgiving horror movies or horror stories, so we could certainly uh, cook something up there. Well, no what, do you, what, do you, what do you think we should cook up? What do you think? Well, let's see. We've got a couple of recipe ideas that Carol uh, provided for us to consider tonight. The first is... Yes. Catherkies. Yes. They're tentacular. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, I, I find that that meme very, uh, or that image very entertaining, but I wouldn't want to be in the same room with that. Well, it's okay because it comes with tartar sauce. It's it's nothing to worry about. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, another possibility. Mm. I'm not even sure what we call this. I guess this is the, the turkey face hugger. Yes. Yes. Face hugger turkey. Yeah. Terrific. That's it. I, I can just see bringing that out to my family, you know, that, that would go over really well. well and here's, <laughs> here's the best comment about that from Nicholas. <laughs> That's, That's just gross. gross. You know, if, yeah. we, if we gross out Nicholas Dyack, I think we've done a pretty good job, I got to say. <laughs> Does take some effort. Yeah, yeah. Huh. So uh, now we have some other things going on in the month of November. Um one advantage that we have of being an HWA member is that we get all sorts of free 
horror books and stories and nonfiction articles sent to us as opt-ins for the Bram Stoker Awards, which is a, a really cool thing. It's a great way to learn what's going on and such. Um, and it's important to know that there's some uh, approaching deadlines if you uh, are submitting something to the jury. The deadline is November 30th for the authors, publishers, or editors to submit their work. However, that doesn't apply to the separate me members' recommendation process. People have one until uh, mid-January, uh, Jim, January right? 15th. Cool. Yes. So uh, if you're an HWA member at any level and you have read some great horror fiction this year, short stories, novels, nonfiction, uh, if you've seen some great horror movies or read some great graphic novels, Go ahead and recommend it. You know, we're, we uh, like to capture as much as we can for the, the Stoker um, recommendations list. We, you know, we love to make sure that we're looking at as much of what's published in any given year. And that's also a fantastic resource. That list is really a snapshot of what was happening each year and what some of the highlights were. Uh, so, you know, if, you, if you've got, got a few minutes, it's not hard to do. All the information is on horror.org or the Bram Stoker Awards website. And you can go ahead and um, make your recommendations. We want to know what you loved this year. Mm -hmm. And it, it comes at a pre particularly good time for me. I get to be on a panel uh, next weekend at PhilCon talking about where do you find books that you want to read. And one of the things I'm going to talk about on the panel is the fact that, well, as a, an HWA member, people tell me all these great books. So it's like just sit back and, and let the information come to you in that case. So that's really handy, something that I like. Yeah, and it has been a great year for horror fiction in all its forms. Uh, a lot of great stuff published this year. And, I, you know, I hear from a lot of people that um, the feeling is horror is is on a, on a huge, um, I don't know, just really a resurgence in the genre. Um, you mm -hmm. know, it's a great time for the genre. There's a lot of different types of horror being published. And it's reaching a wider audience than it may have typically yeah. reached in the past uh, through various media and different types of horror. And that's one of the things I love about horror fiction is that, um, you know, it, it, there are so many great subcategories of horror, subgenres of horror, that there's really something uh, that, you, you know, anyone can find to read. You know, you don't have to worry if you're squeamish. We've got we've got horror for that. <laughs> and and uh, catharkis as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one there's one thing we forgot to say at the top, Jim, is the fact that we have three tremendous readers with us tonight. Um, and we're going to get to listen to them read a piece of their their work. And then we're going to get to talk to them a little bit afterwards. So we're joined tonight by April Gray. Garrett Boatman and Gwendolyn Keist. So I'm very excited because um, these are all three three great you know writers and readers. Yes, I said that right. Right. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thrilled to have uh, to have April and Gwendolyn and Garrett with us tonight. Um, we're always blessed with you know the the great authors who will uh, join us for Galactic Terrors and share their work with us, and I'm very excited about our lineup. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, th I know April in particular tried to, uh, we had, had April on earlier in the year and there were all sorts of issues that she was having at the time and her internet connection failed. So she wasn't able to read, uh, this was back in June maybe. And so we were, in, we're in just happy month, that she yeah. was able to come back. And so far, knock wood, her, her internet connection is stable. Knock on wood. I'm not stable, but her internet is doing well. Yeah. That's okay. That's okay. We don't have to be stable, just the internet. No, no we just have to be here. Yeah. All right. That's and terrific. speaking of our readers, uh, I guess it's time that we should we should get underway with the readings. Let's do it. I'm looking forward to it. All right. So our first reader tonight will be April Gray. April's short stories are collected in the Fairy Cake Bake Shop and in I'll Love You Forever. She has also written urban fantasy novels, Finding Perdita, Chasing the Trickster, and its sequel, St. Nick's Favor. She's edited seven anthologies in the Hells series, the most recent released earlier this year, Hells Mall, Sinister Shops, Cursed Objects, and Maddening Crowds. She was a co-editor of the Bram Stoker Award-nominated A New York State of Fright, and you can find April online at aprilgray.blogspot.com or at April Gray NYC on Twitter and Instagram. So please welcome April Gray.
I'll be reading Hell is Lonely Without You. Dear Claire, I know that you will never read this, but I need to let you know. There's so many things that I wish I could have said, could have made you understand, but it's too late now. Asperger's isn't a mental disorder, and yet they acted like it was. My downfall came when one of the teachers called the scratches on my skin self-mutilation. Suddenly, having a skin condition was a criminal act. My parents had always encouraged me to be brave and speak out. This is America, is right? I told the teacher to mind her own business, and she called Child Protective Services. I'd been going to an alternate medical practitioner for the skin condition and for the other things, things like my not liking to make eye contact and the funny noises and movements I sometimes do. But now I had to see their doctors as well. Their doctors wanted to put me on psychotropic drugs. When my parents refused, CPS went to court and put me into a foster home. The foster home made me take these drugs and I started having seizures on them. When I refused, they held me down and pushed the pills down my throat. The first chance I got, I ran away. But when you're 15, you make mistakes. I went back home again and the authorities found me. This time I was sent to the Rodenberg Center. There were two good things about the rotten, no drugs, and you, Claire. Claire, I miss you so much. I doubt you ever noticed me or knew how I felt. Still, I couldn't help but watch you when I could, like at mealtimes in the cafeteria or when we passed each other in the hallway while going to classes. Did anyone ever tell you that you were beautiful? Did you know? We never talked. You couldn't. All you could do was moan and bang your head on the wall, the desk, or the floor. That was your way of letting us know how you felt. And we all found out eventually, didn't we? They had you wired up, just like I was. And if you banged your head, they'd shock you. If I mouthed off, they'd shock me. That's just the way it was there. Everyone got punished all the time, either shocks or food deprivation. And Claire, you would just take it. Banging your head like the lack of food or shocks didn't affect you at all. As for me, I lost it one day. I tore off the patches so damn quick that the guy with the shock controller didn't have a chance to stop me. Then I hit him with a chair and stole his keys. I left you behind, Claire. I'm so sorry. If I live to be a hundred, I'll never stop regretting that I didn't find a way to rescue you. I was on the run again, but this time I didn't contact my parents. Funny, we're actually from the Ukraine. My parents came here for a better life. Some joke. They are drugging and torturing us here, just like they did in the bad old Soviet days. American psychiatrists have a medication for every emotion and have created a disease out of every feeling. Nobody's safe from them, especially people like us. We represent the big bucks to them. You know, I don't think the Soviets did shock their children. That might just be an American innovation. Finally, luck found me. There's a church on the outskirts of Boston that feeds the homeless, and they let me work in the kitchen and sleep in the basement. The irony is that I have an IQ of 160. I should have been going to Harvard. Yeah, if not for the moronic teacher freaking out, I'd be there now with the scholarship. 
In the afternoons, after I've washed the dishes, I head for the public library. I do research. And then on their computer, sometimes I Google the old rotten. That's how I found out. You were in pain the whole time, weren't you? That's why you kept banging your head and never smiled. Because you were in pain and didn't have any words to tell them how much it hurt. The report said that you had gone from 130 to 90 pounds. You couldn't tell anyone that something was wrong. You were too sick to stand up and still they kept shocking you. The report says they shocked you 60 times that last day as you lay on the floor, your insides hemorrhaging until you died. You'd think somebody would go to jail. You'd think they might close down the place, but they didn't. Life goes on and they send more of us there to be tortured. The soup kitchen isn't too bad, all things considered. Still, what kind of life can I have now, especially with you gone? Claire, I hope wherever you are that you're okay now. There's so much I want to tell you. The internet has lots of info, like how to make stuff that blows up from items you could buy anywhere. The kids were all safe in the dorms while I planted the charges at the school. I didn't know if any of the guards or night watchmen died, but you know what? If they did, just maybe they deserved it because everyone knew what was going on, but no one cared to stop it. It was awesome and deafening. You should have seen the way old Rotten exploded and burned to the ground. It was better than any 4th of July I've seen. And now maybe they will send the kids home and not hurt them anymore. But if they do rebuild or make more places like that, I'll be there. I'll fix any new place just like I did the old one. Because I will always love you. Sincerely, your admirer and adventure, Stan. The end. I have one more. The Butterfly Dream. An emperor dreamt he was a butterfly, flitting and fluttering around, doing as he pleased. He was happy with his life. He didn't know he was an emperor. Then he woke up to find that he was the emperor. But was he an emperor who had dreamt he was a butterfly? Or a butterfly dreaming he was an emperor? Taken from a Chinese folktale. As my finger pulled the trigger and death claimed my body, I woke up. I remembered that it had all been a dream and that reality was an eternity spent drifting in an endless fog. Life was a dream, or in my case, a nightmare. Heaven is my reality, and there is no hell. No, hell is a personal thing. When you know you had a chance for happiness and you squandered it, hell is waking up to find it was all a dream. The nightmare I called life was preferable to the truth that was all a lie. I'd never really been born. No one is. Instead, on occasion, we fall asleep, giving us the chance to dream of an existence that is meaningful. If only I'd remembered. Perhaps those who had lived and loved as intended woke to cherish those days as they float in this fog around me, unseen, perhaps they are happy. They would have no regrets. For me, reality is unbearable. I had the chance to do something wonderful and I squandered it. There is no hell, but regrets forge a place not unlike hell. The nightmare I called life was preferable to this. I would go back in a heartbeat, 
but I can't. Instead, I will spend eternity going over every wrong move I'd made, every bad decision, and pray for a way to go back and do it over. If only I'd been born a butterfly. Thank you. That's it. Wow, April, very, very profound stories, both of them. Thank you so Thank much you. for sharing. Thank Thanks. you so much. You know, the first one, The Hell is Lonely Without You, It, you know, we, we talk about horror stories and we talk about psychological horror and cosmic horror and all that. And I think you point out the fact that, you know, reality can be a horror as well. I, yeah. I think that was really, really gripping and touching um and the, the one good thing i took away from it is that the the narrator did have a momentary connection with her with claire so what uh what what, what are your thoughts then about what's happened to this person and and how he's been affected so much he's found a way to make peace with the past hmm. by writing this letter it's his way of resolution plus he mm -hmm. blew up the place Nothing like revenge to cleanse the soul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, who knows? He's a smart kid. Uh, maybe he'll get some ID or something and redo his life. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he can start over at some point. It would be great. Yeah. I believe he will. He is resourceful. Perhaps he will start over as a butterfly. There we have it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's an intriguing thing to think about the butterfly in that second piece because, you know, there there are those different stages of the butterfly's life. And yet here here's the person saying, I wish I could start over again. Did you sort of intend that when you chose butterfly as, as the, the symbol here? Or what were you thinking? It was a weird thing where somebody had written the first line in a writing group. Oh, yes. Yes. And I picked it up and I thought about the Chinese myth. And then I thought of a Harlan Ellison story I'd once read where mm -hmm. he spends his time berating himself because he committed suicide and hadn't realized that your best chance at happiness is when you're human, which is uh. a little bit Buddhist as well, because then you have the six realms and basically, you know, your chance of getting off the wheel is best when you're not in the animal realm or the hungry gods realm or even the gods realm or the jealous re gods realm. When you're human, you have the best chance of enlightenment. Okay. And, and yet the poor person who has, you know, doesn't find out until after it's too late. So, well, maybe yeah. in Buddhism, at least you have a chance to start over as a beetle and work your way up again. Mm -hmm. They go from beetle to butterfly. Yeah. 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 That could be. So tell me, I, I'm so delighted that we were able to have you back after it was so sad that, you know, that we had technical difficulties with your, your internet connection before. So I'm so happy that you're here. Thank you. I'm happy to be here too. Yeah. So, so what do you like to read? You know, these are both very, very interesting and uh, fascinating stories. What do you like to read? Does that influence what you, what you do and what you write? Um, I've gotten lazier as I've gotten older. Um, I tend to read a lot of um, nonfiction now. Oh. Uh, but when I was younger, I'd go through books and books and books every week. So I read prolifically um, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and the thousands. And then I had my son and there was less time to read. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I, I tend to just uh, read some nonfiction. And uh, when something interests me, uh, I'm very fond of ghost stories. Um, I like ghost stories. I like novels about ghosts. Um, I've been reading a ton of them. Oh, cool. That's exciting. That's exciting. Yeah. Particularly great around Halloween, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Spooky. Now, there's something else that you, I know you do. You do a lot of artwork and uh, watercolors and, and all. I've seen your Inktober things and a lot of the other things that you post. Could you talk oh, a little yeah. bit about 
the different kinds of creativity that you do and do they interact with each other? Does your visual art uh, creation in, affect your writing or spark anything? What's Well, I, I'm just trying to keep my brain lively by acquiring new skills. And I'm really bad at languages. So I figured, well, let's try the visual thing. And uh, when I was younger, I liked to do crafts, a lot of crafts. So right now I'm taking a mixed media class that I feel totally overwhelmed and intimidated by. And it's good to be challenged, you know? It's like, okay, my brain's never really fun functioned this way before. So let's see what happens. Um, cool. you know, yeah, it's inspiring. I, I won't say I'm producing any masterpieces, but I'm having fun. And I appreciate that you share them. I think that's really fun and, and very brave as well for learning a new thing and sharing it as well. Yeah. That's terrific. Well, thank you so much, April. I'm so glad you came on. I'm so glad to have you back with us. So it's I'm great. You, yeah. Just wonderful. Yay. Okay. Thank, thank, thank goodness for good internet. Yeah. <laughs> Terrific. Okay, working. we're gonna we're gonna have you come back at the end when everybody comes back and talk to you a little bit more. I'm looking forward to that. Very good. Okay, Thank th you. Thanks, April. Thank you. I'd like to introduce our next reader, Garrett Boatman. He's the author of Stage Fright, which was originally published by Onyx in 1988 and then reissued by Valancourt Books as Paperbacks from Hell Number Eleven, and of Floaters, an 1890s Victorian. Zombie Adventure, recently published by Bram Stoker award-winning Crystal Lake Publishing. His dark fantasy trilogy, Night's Plutonian Shore, The Clocks of Midnight, and The Mirror of Eternity is being published by J. Ellington Ashton Press. A retired English teacher living in the hills of western New Jersey, Garrett is an active member of the Horror Writers Association and Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America. More information on him can be found at GarrettBoatmanAuthor.com. Thank you for joining us, Garrett. Hi, thank you all for joining me tonight. Tonight I'll be reading from Floaters. The um, a little background about Floaters. Coming up in Jersey City, Floaters is what the police called bodies hauled out of the Hudson and East Rivers. You know, something I heard about it as a teen and young man. Um, back in the 70s, some friends and I went down to a dive shop in Bayonne, New Jersey. I, I, I grew up a few blocks from the Holland Tunnel, for those of you who've been in and out of the Holland Tunnel. Um, we went down to Bayonne, New Jersey to pick up some dive gear. And the owner was a retired cop whose job was hauling bodies out of the river. Told us some interesting stories, gave me some ideas, led the floaters. The names of the hooligan gangs are actual, taken from records. Um, the events or not. I'm going to I'm going to be reading to you from um, chapter one. Let's see how does that go. There you go, floaters. The swells were drunk. There were three of them, young toffs, their fine suits looking worse for wear after a night of East End carousing. Still joking and pulling at a shared bottle as the quarry made its way upriver. Midnight was long past and dawn too far off for Jenkins' taste. Father Thames was in a foul mood. Night was thickest on the Surrey side, the glassworks and wharves invisible behind the greasy banks of fog. On the city side, the electric lights of the Temple Pier and Victoria Embankment glowed through the murk like will-o'-the-wisps. Despite the dark and the fog, old Clarence Jenkins, who had been dipping his oars in these muddy waters since before the great stink, knew every dock and water stair on both sides of the river and could find his way blindfolded. He loved the dear old cantankerous river in all its lights. and liked to think of it as his. But lately, the relationship had soured. He wanted to attribute his failing affection for the river to age. He was getting on 
and the damp aggravating his rheumatism. But that wasn't it. Distrust had set in. Though it had never happened to him personally, he imagined it was like knowing your wife's cheating on you and not being able to prove it, but deep down knowing. Not that Beth would ever, and who would have her? His oars dipped and rose and dipped, and the weary glided in little sprints. Tipple Pier's lights grew brighter. Lately, there was gossip. Tales of disappearances. A colleague, Tim, Tom Button, had gone missing last week, along with the two couples he was rowing over from Southwark to Waterloo Pier. Vanished. Nobody's found. The boat was discovered mired in the mud past Blackfriars. A gentleman's coat and a lady's purse were all that was found of his fare. Clarence has seen the police in their steamers and longboats out searching, plying their lamps over the waters. They told the watermen to take care of what they declined to say, only keep a sharp eye, and if you see anything unusual, do not investigate, but pull hard till you've left whatever it is behind. Had some strange fish inhabited the Thames, some behemoth from the ocean's depths trying its luck in fresher waters? He had once seen a whale beached at Gravesend, reeking worse than the old Thames in summer before Basilget built the embankment and diverted the sewage through his maze of brick tunnels. People had come from miles to wonder at the size of the thing. Looking across the black surface heaving beneath the drifting fog, he shuddered. No, it was an old age or too long acquaintance. Lately, a change had come upon the river. Though it was summer, the nights were cold. And though the flocks of swans that greeted ships in centuries past were greatly reduced, they were still occasionally encountered. In the past week, Clarence had seen not one. The hanging lanterns swayed with the movement of the boat. The toss slurred banter accompanied the near imperceptible dip of the oars. Apparently, the youngest of the three had been pickpocketed. It was her pimp that lifted your wallet, a somewhat older, yellow-vested gentleman said. She was no prostitute, insisted the hatless youth. His cravat was loose, his slurred syllables testament to his inebriation. His fellows rolled their eyes and shared a knowing look. I suppose you'll compose a villanelle about her virtue, said the hook-nosed sporting lad. How much did you lose, said the first, either to distract from the other seas or to further taunt. Four guineas, the injured youth presented a pugilous visage to his mates. The other's low whistle carried in the fog. He could have bought all the whores in the hall with that, Yellow Vested ventured. Not to worry, his dad will replace it, hook nose loomed. I'll not be telling father. I should think not. Chalk it up to experience. Never carry more than you need and always ask for credit. I don't think his girl would take credit. She wasn't my girl. The beleaguered youth was getting annoyed. I should say not. The topic exhausted, the sporting gentleman produced a cigarette case. Smokes were selected. The case returned. Lighting their cigarettes was no mean feat in the damp. Jenkins glanced over his shoulder. The lamps of Temple Pier glowed brighter. Though more, no more than a dozen yards away, the pier itself remained invisible behind the fog. He was turning the boat when an oar snagged on something. He gave a tug. It wasn't unusual to come upon refuse, rags, dead dogs. Once a half-submerged horse floated past. Whatever it was, the boat stalled and veered back into the channel. What the blazes? 
What's wrong, Gov? A hand came over the gunnel. The youngest Toff screamed. Yellow vest ill-advisedly stood, locked the boat, and staggered. Hook nose, half rose to grab his mate, further upsetting the boat, and Yellow vest fell into the water. Clarence saw none of this. He was mesmerized by what followed the hand. The face that rose above the gunwale was pot and noseless and pale as an alewife's belly. One eye was white as fog, the other was missing. Clarence unshipped an oar and slammed it into the boarder's face. Hand and face disappeared. Yellow vest was screaming, splashing frantically. The gentleman's hand grasped the gunwale, and his face appeared for an instant, eyes brimming with horror. Then, as if yanked back into the water, he was gone. Fair's forgotten. Clarence's hand shook as he tried to return, return the oar to its lock. Missed. Got it. Then he was roaring as if the devil were coming for him. But other hands were on the gunnels, loaded faces glowing in the luminous fog. Beneath the bridge, on a cobbled path beside a canal, old Daniel Tobin raised the bottle to the dead and sang into the billowing fog. No more we'll go a-sailing, we'll round the horn no more. So let's drop the anchors, laddies, and all the boats ashore. For it's Tyburn that awaits me, the mast, the gallows tree. The rigging is a single rope, not no sailors be. For it's to the tree against the gale, the roaring in my heart. And on the morn, hold up the mast, I must this world depart. But spare no sorrow, laddies, drink up all ye may. And sing a capstan shanty, and salute the breaking day. So tip the jug and drink up, boys, and see me on my way. Or I shall up the Tyburn mast and dance until I sway. So reef the mainsails, laddies, and haul the boats ashore. The ship will leave at anchor. We'll sail the sea no more. His song done, old Dan drank and smacked his lips. And his gleaming eyes, seeing bygone days, held his bottle high and danced a jig. But the stones were damp, and he slipped and fell with a booming splash, and the water closed over his head. He came up sputtering and rapidly sobering, and reached for the greasy curb. But a hand clenched his leg and another his belt and hauled him under where pale faces grinned. His scream rose in bubbles as they dragged him down. And that's chapter one. Thank you. Garrett, thank you. That was that was terrific. I appreciate the uh, your song stylings as well. There you go. <laughs> Um, so let, let's what talk be. about what's that? It is what it be. Yes, let's talk about floaters. So um, I was blown away by the historical aspects of of this. Um, okay. It's I mean, first of all, it's it's a really great fast paced horror tale. Um, but I just the the interest intricacies of and i know you didn't quite get into this in the first chapter and i won't i'll try not right. to spoil anything but the um the interactions <laughs> and the rivalries and the politics between the different gangs of of london at that time uh were such an important part of this how, how did you research that was that is that an area of interest you've had or did you decide well, that would be a great setting and then go start learning about it okay um, I read very widely. Back in college, I was majored in uh, Renaissance drama and poetry, medieval literature. Later on, I really got into the Victorian literature, read a lot of it over the years, loved the stuff. Uh, and that's where early fantasy 
comes from and all the all the horror that came out of uh, England and America back then read through all that stuff um, the idea for floaters originally came from stage fright my first book in fact it opens up with a scene from floaters but it takes place in modern times in the Hudson River but that was just one scene and I moved you know the book goes on to other things it makes sense for those who've read it understand what I'm talking about but over the years a number of people told me hey uh, floaters should be its own book because the idea was behind floaters teenagers saving the city like in the blob and all those other old movies old favorites yes so um i decided to turn it to its own book and since i have such a great love for that late victorian time and know so much about it i have maps and everything else it wasn't that far reach i already had so much of the research and um started looking at maps and seeing the you know as if you were making a movie you go around searching for uh, sets mm -hmm. so i figured all my set pieces out and laid them out and then started writing and i decided to write a book that mimicked the uh, process of writing pulp fiction with no or almost no exposition and no flashbacks just go for it hit the ground running so it was it was a test to see if i could pull that off Oh, I think you pulled it off very well. Thank you. Um, it's a gripping book. It's, you know, the story begins right there in chapter one and doesn't doesn't let up until the end of the book. So it's it's truly a page turner in the best sense of the uh, the phrase. Um, and then uh, I have we have a question in the audience I, and I'm going to bring this one up. And I, then I have another question for you about the historical aspect of it. But we have a question from Lee Murray. And this is a really interesting oh point and it's a question i um Lowly. <laughs> it was part of the the story i really enjoyed but lee um is asking if women in the gangs actually had the kind of agency in that period that they have in the story did you find anything in your research to support that yes i did yes i did <laughs> um one of the gangs the elephant and castle gang they were more well-dressed and looked down on they were the aristocrats of the gangs and by the way the gangs were hooligans they were called hooligan gangs in the old police reports the uh the bailey records you know the old bailey criminal records and trials that i looked through um and some of these female gangs the, the that one gang had a female element to it and they would go into ritzy stores well-dressed and shoplift turn around and sell those dresses and use the money to go buy other dresses for themselves and jewelry and everything. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of the women had quite a bit of agency at that time. That's interesting. Yeah. The, the, the dynamic of the gangs, the personalities, um, it was, it's unique, you know, it, in the sense that they, they had their own, um, style society. of fighting the style of fighting too, but the best, yeah, but, but it wasn't just about, fighting mm -hmm. it was more to it there were you know they, there was a sense of um i guess in some cases a bit of you know a sense of honor or a sense of pride uh that they were i yes yeah mm -hmm. uh, which was very interesting now i can't get too detailed with this next question without giving much away so i won't but a lot of the action hinges on the geography of london mm -hmm. the thames uh, what's that the thames river yeah yes exactly mm -hmm. Is that all accurate to the time that layout those those structures and channels and thoroughfares? Yes, yes. I I have um, a map that I refer to, and you can blow it up and go zoom in on different sections. Then we go in and look in old books to to research that stuff. I mean, I've I, I read a lot of nonfiction in that period too, like uh, uh, road building. Mm -hmm. Uh, another book on the uh, Victorian, late Victorian, um, Waste Disposal, The Destructors, for example, The uh, Night Soil Men Pick Up the Garbage or whatever, and uh, things would get transported to these destructors where they would grind and burn things to cinders. Those cinders could then be used to build roads and so forth. So, yeah, it's very uh, accurate. 
Yeah, that's great. So yeah, if, if you enjoy historical fiction of any kind, especially historical horror fiction, I highly recommend Floaters. Um, it's full of great historical details and things like that that are a lot of fun. Um, now, a question about Stage Fright. That was originally published, um, was it 1989? 1988. 1988. Ju July 88, yes. How was the experience of Stage Fright being sort of rediscovered through paperbacks from hell for you? Interesting story. Um, I had sold Stage Fright with a telephone call. I just okay. picked up the phone when I finished, and I called. Um, I said, well, Stephen King's books are published by Signet Press, right, paperbacks. So I called Signet. I said, can I speak to an editor? They connected me to the editor, told him the background. I said, send him the manuscript. The next month I had a, uh, a contract. Took over a year before the book came out. So years later now, um, I was writing those three novels you mentioned before, the trilogy. And when I finished the last one, it took me several years to write those since I retired from teaching in high school, English. I finished up the manuscript and I said, okay, now I can go rejoin the world. I deliberately stayed off uh, internet and so forth. And for, a, for a, quite a while, I was just living in the world of the books. So I got online, ran a search for my name and my book and so forth, just to see what was going on and found that people thought I was dead and the book was going for about $300. And I, yeah, I was shocked. So I saw, and of course that made me think, well, my new book's gonna sell like that, you know? But anyway, so I come across a uh, reason, part of the reason for this is Grady Hendrix had this book out called uh, Paperbacks from Hell. And some of these paperbacks that had gotten popular through that had been reissued by Valancourt Books. So I looked up Valancourt Books, emailed them, said, hey, you want to publish Stage Fright as a paperback from hell? Uh, James Jenkins said, yeah. Sent him a copy and he got republished. That's amazing. And I'm sure they were really happy to find out that you weren't dead. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's crazy that all of that stuff just sort of happened yep. without your awareness of it. And uh, yeah, I think, I mean, Paperbacks from Hell has sparked a lot of interest in many of the books that Grady covered, uh, some some for the better, some for the worse. <laughs> well, it was like walking down memory lane. Yeah. So many covers and so many books I had read. Um, but it's great that, uh, I mean, first of all, I'm amazed that you sold that first book with a phone call. Mm. I, I think that's probably, uh, you know, an impossibility in today's publishing world. I agree. Um, but it's great that Valancourt picked it up right away and it's nice to see it back in print thank you yeah so does anyone have uh in our audience have any other questions for garrett so we can go ahead and put them in the chat um we'll be talking uh to all of our readers tonight about what they have coming up next at the end of the program uh so if we don't have any other questions at the moment garrett we will see you again for the roundup uh at the end and we'll uh we'll move on to our next reader all right, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our next reader tonight is Gwendolyn Keist. She is the Bram Stoker award-winning author of The Rust Maidens, Bone Set and Feathers, and Her Smile Will Untether the Universe, Pretty Mary's All in a Row, and The Invention of Ghosts. Her short fiction and nonfiction works have appeared in Nightmare Magazine, Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy, Vestarian, Tours Nightfire, The Dark, and Daily Science Fiction, among others. Originally from Ohio, she now resides on an abandoned horse farm outside of Pittsburgh with her husband, two cats, and not nearly enough ghosts. Find her online at GwendolynKeist.com. Welcome, Gwendolyn. I'm Gwendolyn Keist, and I'm so excited to be here and see everybody in the chat. So hi, everybody. 
And I'm going to be reading from the book that you just saw in a little cool promo. It's Bone, Scent, and Feathers. It's my second novel, and it came out a year ago. It's already been a year. Time means nothing in a pandemic. So I'm going to start right at the beginning in chapter one. When the first crows fall from the sky, the villagers know I'm to blame. It doesn't take much to guess that it's me, the witch that lives outside of town, the only witch left here. Soon, if the witch finders keep building their pyres across the countryside, I might be the only witch left anywhere. Then I'll be the one blamed for everything, a fail harvest, a sour business deal, an infant with colic. There will be no ill I can't be punished for. But even as feathers clog up the villagers' chimneys and talons scrape across the stained glass windows of the church, I'm none the wiser to it. It's not until I'm halfway to town that I see a crow tumble out of the clouds. At first, I'm sure it's only my eyes playing tricks on me again, a mirage dancing alongside the demons and ghosts that have been pinwheeling at the edges of my vision for years. So I ignore the harbinger and keep going until it's too late to easily turn back. By the time the crow is joined by starlings and bluebirds and cardinals, all the colors banding across the slate gray sky of February like a deranged aurora borealis, I'm already at the crossroads, halfway between everywhere and nowhere. With four directions to go and none of them very welcoming, I have only bad choices. North, toward a place I hope never to visit, the capital city that will burn any witch they can get hold of. Off the beaten path toward the east and into the highland forest with its ancient phantoms and toadstool circles, I can't help but shudder. These days, some land is too haunted, even for a witch. South, toward my Spartan college, cot cottage, back the way I came, into the quieter woods where I dwell, where one day, if I'm lucky, I'll die alone. If I'm not lucky, I'll die the same way as the others, among flame and straw and screams that go unanswered. Or I could grit my teeth and go to the place I've been heading all along ever since I set out at sunrise this morning, west into the town that doesn't want a witch, but is cursed with me, anyhow. The trees murmur all around me, and I hold perfectly still at the crossroads, already knowing what I should do. Turn and race back home, as fast as I can. Anything to escape this place and these birds. But I only shake my head. That won't work either. After all, if I ran every time I was scared, I'd never stop running. Two things. That's all I need from the village. Then I might make it until spring thaw. I clasp my hands in front of me and walk on toward the village. When I reach the town square, the birds are still falling and there's no one on the street. They're all hiding inside, families gathered at their front window, sobbing at the sky, glaring at me as I pass. I tip my head to the ground, a scream blossoming in my throat. I didn't do this, I want to tell them. And it's mostly true. This isn't from a spell I cast, but I know they blame me anyhow. They believe my magic has run wild from this grief I can't contain. The same grief the villagers live with too. They have to see the evidence of it every day in the town square where the ground is still charred black from the pyres. It seems no matter how many rainstorms we get, nothing will wash this town clean again. It's been five years since the witch finders were here, but they more than left their mark. Wherever you were in the village, you'd know when those men from the capital arrived. Their cloaks so thick and billowy, they seemed to cover all the rooftops, their boots perfectly polished, so when they loomed over you, you couldn't even look down to escape. You'd only see yourself reflected back in the accusing leather sheen. They roamed our streets, day and night, taking notes in their ledgers, arresting without warrants, shooting our wrens and cardinals and robins out of the sky until they'd chased them all away. Thanks to those men, no one had seen a single bird in this village for five years. That is, until today. Now the birds cascade around me and I freeze up in the middle of the street, still wanting to flee back to the forest. The copper rooftop on the corner glimmers in the sun and I realize I'm already here. The general store, my first stop. The heavy wooden door swings open in my hand and I slip inside only to discover it's no safer. What I need is in the back of the store, but that's where everyone else is too. Huddled together, tangled up in a human rat king, a smattering of patrons cowering as far from the front window in the carnage as they can get. I halt in the aisle only a few paces away as they stare at me. Why is she doing this? They mumble to each other, their skin wan, their eyes swirling dark. I stay put, not wanting to spook them. If I move too quickly, they might panic in mass, and then things will get so much worse. 
Are you open? I say, and someone lets out a strident laugh. It's the clerk, half hidden in the far back. Why bother asking, she says. You'll do whatever you want, anyway. My throat constricts, and I want to tell her, oh, that isn't true, but it won't matter. I might not have done this on purpose, but they'll never believe that, because they never believe me. The clerk slides out from behind the counter, pushing to the front of the crowd. She looks right at me, and I recognize her from years ago, from a different life, when I used to teach her and the other girls our age a bit of my hand-me-down magic, how to conjure a glamour, how to seed the face of your true love in the runny whites of an egg. I wanted to teach them more. I wanted to teach them everything, but all the parents found out first, and that was that. Mothers and fathers always put a stop to things they don't understand. Why do you want to help those girls, my own mother asked me, when she caught me in the forest with them. A ring of salt around us. Because they're my friends, I said, and she flashed me a cruel smile that could have stopped time. Wait until you need them, she said. Wait and see how fast they run. Above us, a bird thuds against the roof, and another, and another after that, and the clerk edges closer to me, her jaw set. Take whatever you need, she says, her voice sharp and cold as chiseled iron. My head down, I move past the bins of coffee and sugar and spiced tobacco. The aisles are cramped and grimy, and the others watch me as I pass, inching back several steps, terrified they might accidentally brush against me. She looks worse, they whisper, and I know they're right. Since the last time I was here in the fall, I've been wasting away, bit by bit. Acorn flour, roasted pine bark, bits of crystallized honey. There isn't much left in my cupboard this time of year, which means there isn't much left of me. But I never come to the village and ask for a meal. I don't trust what they put in my food. The clerk is the only one who comes closer, matching me step for step, tracking me, whatever aisle I choose. I breathe in, not remembering what to call her. I used to know her name. I used to know all the girls' names, but like everything about this village, I've done my best to forget. It's easier that way, pretending I never knew her at all. As I push to the end of the aisle, she drifts one step nearer, cornering me between dusty bins of marjoram and cardamom and cayenne. Why do you keep doing this? The question simmers on her lips, her breath hot and sweet like candied cinnamon. Why don't you stay gone? She glares right through me, her mouth twisted, and I'm sure she's about to scream or spit at me. But then something in her shifts, her face going dark. Please, Odette, she says, her eyes glistening, thin tears streaking down her cheeks. Haven't we lost enough already? As if I'm to blame for all this loss instead of the witch finders. She thinks it's so simple, all the villagers do, that if I stop doing magic, we'll be safe and the witch finders will forget all about us. What no one understands is that I've tried. Every night I turn away from the dark and do my best to forget, my mind going gray as I erase the spells I memorized as a child, the intricate rituals my mother taught me, those words that can carry the weight of the world in only a few syllables. Over and over, I practice being someone else, since being me has done no good. Except the truth has a terrible tendency of leaking in at the edges. You can only hide from yourself for so long. On the bottom shelf, I finally spot it, an overstuffed satchel of salt, first item off my list, and one step closer to escaping this town. I reach out for it, but instantly a sharp murmur jolts through the whole store. Your hands, the clerk says, and dread clenches in my guts because I see it too. My fingernails are caked thick with dirt. She's been digging in the cemetery again, the others whisper, and they're right. I'd hoped it was only a bad dream, but these scratches on my palms are real too, from the rusted coffin nails biting into my skin. I was really there last night, among the tombs of the other witches, the tombs of my family. The front window bows inward and another crow cascades past the front awning. My head spins as I carry the salt to the counter, clasping it close to my chest to keep my hands from trembling, all this power bubbling up inside me. The clerk doesn't bother to meet me. With graveyard dirt on my hands, nobody will come near me now. So I drop my coins on the counter. Two pence too many. At least that way, no one can call me a thief. Back on the street, I dodge down an alley away from the villagers' prying eyes. A sparrow topples to the cobblestone next to me, followed by a robin and a starling. Together they look so unreal, their eyes glaze, their bodies still. All the birds are silent. Even as they fall, they make no sound. I'll stop there. Wow.
Wow, that's so cool. Very exciting. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you so much, Gwendolyn. <clears throat> I, I have to tell you, I am currently in the middle of reading The Rust Maidens, uh, oh. and I'm having a lot of fun because it's an audiobook that I'm listening to, and I can go out and do leaves on my tractor in my backyard while I'm listening to this really great story. So, <laughs> so that's very, very fun. Um, but one of the things that I noticed about that book is that there's a really specific, clear voice for the character, and I think that's something that you do very, very well. And uh, we, we seem to have the same thing here in this story, which is very exciting. Um, how, how did you go from Rust Maidens, which is set in, uh, what, 1980s Cleveland, which mm -hmm. starts out as a real location, uh, at least. And uh, I won't say any more about that. Uh, this one, though, I don't think this is necessarily a real location in our world this minute. I'm just going to say. No, no, I wouldn't say so. No. <laughs> I mean, it's based on actual witch hunts, but it, I would say it's not really, you know, there weren't really people who could make birds fall from the sky, for example. Yes. yes. So how, how did you turn your, your mind and your brain to, to looking at a, a fantasy setting, like a dark fantasy setting like this? Did it work easily for you or? Yeah, I mean, you know, I love fairy tales. And so this Bone Set and Feathers is more of a fairy tale. Although I kind of yeah. almost think of the Rust Maidens as kind of being a Rust Belt fairy tale. So it's yeah. just, I, I love a lot of different locales. And I think that that's one of my favorite things about writing is I don't have to have an attention on just this one thing. I can go to all these different places. So that's that's something I really enjoy doing. And so that was that was definitely with Bone Set and Feathers. I kind of wanted to go from from a place that was really rooted in reality you know, to somewhere that, that really wasn't. So yeah, it just, it seemed like a really fun. And I always love to challenge myself as a writer. I always love to try something that maybe I didn't do the last time. So that way, you know, I huh. kind of keep myself, keep myself busy. <laughs> oh, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Now the, this book has been out for about a year, you said. Mm -hmm. Yep. How, how was it publishing a new novel during everything that's been going on, the pandemic and... <laughs> I, I think as hard as everything else in the pandemic, right? I feel like everything has been very, very intense for the last year and a half for, for everybody in all different ways, obviously. But yeah, I mean, it, it was it was very different. You know, you're used to kind of going live uh, for readings. I love I love these types of things, though. I love online events a lot because like, you know, it's, it's really nice and you can you can see a lot of people, you know, a lot of people can come that couldn't come to an in-person reading. But, you know, you kind of go into you know, writing a book and you think it's going to be, I'm going to go to conventions, I'm going to do in-person readings. And then obviously none of that happened last year. So it was definitely, you know, you have to kind of pivot and, and say, all right, well, how am I going to, I'm going to do this instead. <laughs> right. So I, I would assume you had finished work on it well before the pandemic began and all of that. Finished it up during the beginning of the, the pandemic. Oh, okay. yeah, I mean, finished it up right at, right at like as that was starting. So yeah, that was, yeah. That, that's, very that was challenging i think i think for all of us writing during the pandemic you know how much is it going to affect our writing how much is it not going to affect it so that's that's been a challenge <laughs> absolutely yeah well that's one advantage to writing in a fantasy world you don't have to include masks or anything in, in your story you know <laughs> yeah, or true. historical things too yeah yeah, yeah so do you do you have any are there common themes between say this book and the rust maidens that that you revisit or is this sort of a completely new they're, they're very distinct works I, I think in a lot of ways they're distinct there's definitely yeah. you know a strong element of female friendship and body horror that's in both yeah. of them that i would say is, is very very common in general to my work but in particular the first two my first two novels yeah okay yeah and in in the rust maidens too i remember there was a big element of uh, I guess, sort of not fitting in with the community, with society. Yes. And that that's definitely in this too. I think, again, that's in a lot of my work. It's just a, I write about a lot of outsiders. That's just sort of always there. Even, I, I don't even think about it anymore. As soon as you said that, I'm like, yeah, of course that that's in both of them. But yeah, like it's just always like outsider characters trying to kind of find their place and find their way in the world. Yeah. Right. I, I think that's something that so many people can identify with as well, because nobody ever fits in everywhere, you know, and uh, 
And, and also that's one of the great uh, uh, things about horror is talking about the other, you know, what, what is the, the scary thing? Is, is it me? Is it them? Is it me because I'm not like them? You know, mm-hmm. what, what is scary? Yeah. So, yeah. I do think horror is so such a unique uh, genre for that, for looking at the other, for looking at the other, and then also looking from the perspective of the other. So yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Do you have a, a preference or are you more comfortable with the short fiction or longer fiction and and you write poetry as well right no i, I write no. non-fiction i don't write not, poetry okay not not yet anyways that's almost like a threat like maybe not, not till next week yeah, uh, yeah right? <laughs> <laughs> um you know i i love i love all kinds of fiction i i do think that there's a part of me because i first came into horror through short fiction and through short stories, like reading it. And so I think my heart always is kind of there because that was, you know, I remember picking up anthologies like, you know, um, from my parents when I was younger and and I just loved them so much. And that was really where I found my love of horror fiction. So I think there's always part of me that's like short stories, but I love novels and I love what you can do with novels and how you can, how you can go so much deeper into the characters. So I think that that that's a really, a really fun challenge as well. Hmm. Yeah. Is there, are there any particular anthologies that you read early on that really connect, <laughs> you connected with or, you know, y- yes. But like I never remember the names of them. It was like Tales of the Supernatural or something. I think I have a copy. I think like the one that I'm thinking of, like when I met my husband, he had a copy of it in his library. So I'm like, wow, yes, yes. Oh, this, this yeah. guy's a keeper. He's a keeper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I forget the name of it, but I need to look it up because it was like this really like important anthology to me when I was like really. Probably 12, 13 years old of, of finding it on my parents' shelf and be like, this is really cool. I love this. This is so neat. And yeah. also, you know, I think a lot of us come into horror fiction through Edgar Allan Poe and then also through Stephen King. You know, and I, I love Night Shift. That, that's, you know, that's such a great anthology. That's such a, you know, that, that was probably my first, not anthology, but collection. That was probably the first like single uh, author collection I ever remember reading and being like, wow, look at all these different types of short stories you can write. Like, it just seemed like a really neat, you know, some of them were very long, some of them were shorter. They were in all different like locales, like we were just talking about. So that, that was really neat to see. So I remember that very well, very well too. Yeah, Night Shift was was one of mine too. One of the first yeah. ones I read. It was like, okay, this is pretty amazing what you can do in the in the genre. Yeah, cool. So, well, I am glad to hear that I'm not the only one who cannot remember a title on demand. So, that, right. thank you for that. I feel so much better now, Gwendolyn. That's terrific. Uh, but you know, it makes me wonder. Uh, so, your your parents uh, had horror in the house, and you were reading it at a kind of perhaps a young age for for reading horror. Was it the kind of thing? Did you guys discuss it at the dinner table, or was it just like, oh, read whatever you want, you know, and choose your own books? How did it go? <laughs> So, and I also think my dad's actually watching this right now. So if you cool. my dad, like he hey, dad. read me Edgar Allan Poe when my, I was in my mom's belly, yes. like when, when she was pregnant with me. Wow. So like. You were I, the telltale heart. Okay. Yeah. I understand it now. That's terrific. <laughs> so it was always a thing in our house. And like, my mom was the one who introduced me to Bradbury when I was like four or five or something. Yeah. So it was like. You know, it was always there. So it was they they definitely did not care I was reading because they were telling me all about it or reading it to me. So it was never like it was never a big deal in, in that regard. You know, I don't think they were either of them hugely into Stephen King, though. They had Stephen King, but they were like much more into into like Poe and Bradbury and some other authors. But we did have some Stephen King around. But I think I'm the biggest Stephen King fan in the family. And I'm not as big of a fan as a lot of people in the horror genre. I love some of the stuff, but like some people are like every single one. But like in my family, I do think I was like the biggest Stephen King fan. <laughs> That's it. We had to find your niche somewhere. Poe and Bradbury were already claimed. So exactly. <laughs> but that's amazing that your parents really, um, you know, that they they enjoy that that writing too, and and had no issues exposing you to it. And um, I mean, it makes such a huge difference. I, I had a similar experience growing up, where my mother's a huge horror fan, my father's a huge science fiction fan, and uh, we had books all over the house. So they. Whether they wanted me to read them or not, they had no idea what I was reading. And, you know, it was just sitting there. So, um, but it, it makes a real uh, impression, I think, mm-hmm. when you're you're young and you get exposed to that work. So that's amazing. Mm-hmm. 
and I had something similar. My parents woke me up at for, to see the midnight show of uh, Little Shop of Horrors, you know, the original black and white version when it came on at midnight. And I was like seven. It's like, okay. So they put me to bed, woke me up. I watched it. I went back to bed. It's like, cool movie, mom. Yeah. Right. <laughs> So, that's what did I know? I was seven. Yeah. So I, I have a, a a question not directly related to writing, but I'm kind of interested in the fact that you live on an abandoned horse farm. I oh, wanted to ask that as well. Okay, how did this happen? <laughs> yeah, is, is it was it? I mean, is it abandoned? Abandoned? I mean, I'm sure that you know. It's it, you mean former horse farm? Or yeah, like, I mean it's more former <laughs> horse farm because that's what my poor husband always says. He's like, our house isn't abandoned. We live here, but like. <laughs> We have electricity. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like the person who owned it before us had had a lot of horses. They still have a horse farm down the down the street. Like we pass the horses. It's like a huge like thing. But they had horses here, and there was like fences and there's troughs and everything and lots of barns that have like we've had to tear down over the years because they're like so old they were falling down. So it was like you know. So it, there's some remnants of of the horses, but not not a lot. I think somebody asked me at some point if I've ever, we've ever found any horse skulls or ske like skeletons. No, we haven't. We haven't. We found some like deer skeletons and stuff, but like nothing. Yeah. No horses. No, I, I you right. know, the horses moved on. They moved down the road. The horses are safe. <laughs> All right. And and thus I would assume no no horse ghosts. No, <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Because people have asked me that too. And I'm like, no. I don't think so. I don't think there's any horse ghosts. But I love how you <laughs> answer that with disappointment. <laughs> but did, do you guys have a barn? I mean, can we come over and do spooky readings in your barn at someday? That would be fun. <laughs> you know, like the barn we have is just like, it's still filled with like old junk. Like, I don't even know that all of it is ours. Like, it's it's not it's like, I wish I could say, you know, it, it's kind of cool looking from the outside, but like the inside is just it's just dirty. It wouldn't be fun. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, we will keep that for our imagination then instead. Yes. Yeah. Imagine the horse ghosts like haunting the, the ghostly, you know, barn out there. It's not like that, but that's a better version. of. Well, place. now we know what the next story is that you're going to write. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I, I have one other. This is a, like a specific writery kind of question too. But the the Rust Maidens and uh, the one that you've just read from are both first person stories. Do you like telling stories that way? Does that work for you better? Or you know, I I, I think a lot of my stuff is first person. I also do a lot of second person. Like I really love second oh, person. I, I'm, I'm surprised. Hard to do well. Yeah. yeah, I'm surprised by that. If you would have told me that 10 years ago, like I was not into it, but then I started reading a lot of second person. It's been published over the last five or six years that I loved. I'm like, I'm going to try this. And I, I, I find it really fun. I find it like a really fun, you know, again, like an exercise, like something to like challenge myself with. So I like, I like second person as well. I don't do a lot of third person, but I'm always pushing myself. Like, you need to do more third person because I don't do as much with that. It's mostly first and second person. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, second person is tricky. It can be. Yeah, it really Especially can if it goes be. on too long. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's why I, I was just talking. I forget who I was. It was other writers I was just talking to about that, that I just feel like second person, like for a novel. I don't know that I've ever read a second person novel that would work. Like, I'm, I'm sure somebody could do it. But like, as much as I like second person, I think it would become tedious. But I don't know. And that's just it. There's not a lot out there. So I, I would be like totally willing to like read it. But I don't know if I'd ever want to write a, a second person mm. novel. That would be kind of intense. Yeah, I think you know, the only <laughs> second person novel I've read is Bright Lights, Big City. Uh, okay. Blanking on the name of the author. Um, I've heard of it. I haven't read yeah. that. I've heard of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's a it's a not not a genre novel it's uh it was made into a movie with michael j fox and it's um story okay. of a of young guy who comes to new york city out of college and gets um i think he's working at sort of like a new yorker type magazine and gets into all of these issues over his head and things like that yes and okay yeah. i do think i i don't know the i've heard of the book but i i have heard of the movie i think i know the movie better that does sound familiar oh uh, here we go we're, we're getting a little uh help from our audience tom Didi, come with okay. me by ron malfi is second person and it's wonderful okay okay that's i just finished that that is a wonderful book okay oh cool but it, it didn't know. even occur to me that it was second person because of the the nature of the narration it's a unique sort of style so but um, thank you tom that's great so the style didn't overwhelm the story which is really well really yeah. cool yeah. you can read that i haven't read that one yet yeah 
Oh, and here we go. Christopher Here's... Ryan. Thank you. Jay McInerney wrote Bright Lights, Big City. That was the name I was trying to come up with. Okay. And, and another Nicholas, comment by Nicholas. Yeah. On a winter's a... night, a traveler. Okay. okay. By okay. I definitely Kelsey. want to read some second person novels because it just seems yeah. like. Yeah. Let's all go read these. these. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Actually, there's another really good use of second person. If you put it on the back cover, it says you pick up the book, you walk to the cash register, you buy this book. That works really great, you know? Yeah. That's it. <laughs> cool. All right. Um, so shall we bring fun. back our other readers and uh, kind of yeah, see what everybody has coming up on the horizon? Yeah. Uh, well, before we do that, we'll just, just one more from Lee Murray. Oh, Joseph yeah. Turcott has a wonderfully dark dystopian yeah. series in second person. Yeah. Great. Oh, cool. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. This is yeah. great. Thank you. Oh, now, now. Right. now. Yeah. There, oh, where? Welcome back, April and Garrett. All right. Howdy. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming back on with us. Do you guys like to write in first person or third person? Garrett, what do you like? Okay. Uh, mostly third Four. person. Mostly third person. Um, I like to do the uh, multiple viewpoint chapters alternating different characters. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's mm -hmm. fun. That's really fun. What about you, April? Do you Flash fiction, do... I like first person. Mm -hmm. A lot mm -hmm. of times I'll write a novel first person and then convert it to third person. Wow. Oh. That's a, a lot, lot of work. work. Yeah. <laughs> That's just it is. You know, yeah, I, but... I, I, I had... Whoa. I need it for the connection. Oh, okay. that makes sense. I, I did that once. The first thing I ever wrote was in first person. And what I wound up doing was using dictation software. I read it from a piece of paper and I translated it in my head as I dictated it into third person. And it actually worked. But yeah, mm -hmm. nobody's published it though. So maybe it didn't work. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's still time. You never first. know. Yeah. Yeah. So. What's what's coming up for everybody? Has any got anything you're working on that you can tell us about? What do you I think? I signed a contract. I can't talk about it, but I signed a contract. Excellent. Very it's good. a ghost story set cool. in New York City. Mm. Fun. Um, and uh, I'm very excited. I hope to see it come out next year. I love ghost stories. Yeah. Terrific. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Garrett, how about you? Got anything you're working on coming out soon? Well, Something working all the time, all the time, because what else is there to do? Um, I just sold this story last week, I believe it was, to um, St. Joshi, the um, Penumbra Three. It won't be out until next year, though. Oh wow! Um, I think I wrote that in present tense. I can't remember right now. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Novels. They got those three novels. They're still working on them. Yeah. I've seen. I've seen two of the covers, and they're being. The first one's being formatted right now, so we don't have a publication date for a nice Plutonian Shore. Okay. And uh, and I've seen the cover for the second one, Clocks of Midnight. Beautiful covers. Um, and what I'm working on, um, I have a police, a parapsychological police procedural called, and I'm calling it working title in death's dream kingdom takes place in manhattan i researched uh well i didn't want to do it in present time because i didn't want to use uh cell phones and masks and all that so i'm going to put it in the 90s so i have a lot of research on that already in those times that's good new york was still uh still a bit of the the wild Oh and yeah, there in the nineties, mm -hmm. and the computer systems for and camera stuff for crime was just starting out. In mm -hmm. other words, in other words, a lot of research again. Mm -hmm. I love my research. I'd write a lot more if I didn't do so much research. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. Mm. That's fun. And Gwendolyn, what's on the uh, the horizon for you? Yeah, my third novel, Reluctant Immortals, is coming out next August, which seems like a long time from now, but it will probably be here before I know it. And it's coming out uh, from Saga Press, and it follows uh, Lucy Westenra from Dracula and Bertha Antoinetta Mason from Jane Eyre, and it's set in 1967 California during the Summer of Love as they are trying to outwit Rochester and Dracula, so. 
<laughs> I'm very excited. Like I put basically everything that I love. It's like gothic horror. It's the 1960s. It's yes. a couple of characters I love that didn't get what I feel like they're they're due because I love them so much. So I'm really excited. I'm I'm super excited for everybody to read it. Everybody's gonna have to hear me talk about it for the next like eight or nine months and then beyond. So I, I, I'm just upset we have to wait that long. It sounds fantastic. <laughs> That's terrific. Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, yeah, we, we, we've got ghosts in the 90s with with vampires. Okay, this is cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're a good crowd to have put, put on together. This is fun. <laughs> it's a cutie alert yeah. about police activity at City Hall. <laughs> cool. You know, there's one other thing that we uh, didn't even mention, but um, in case you're interested in hearing more about what's coming up, we actually have a newsletter and y'all can yeah. sign up for it if you want to hear about uh, some of our shows that are coming up. And those are uh, always on the second Thursday, but here's our newsletter. We do not spam you. We just send out two things a, a month, you know, of what's coming up. And one is a couple weeks ahead and the other is the day of it, just to remind you what the link is and all, because that's one of the hardest things when you're doing online stuff is to figure out where to find it. So we send you a newsletter that day to give you the link to get in. So please feel free to join in. And the other fun thing to say, if, if you happen to be watching on YouTube, Please subscribe to the Galactic Terrorist channel and please go click that little like button because apparently that helps YouTube decide that they want to show us to more people because we would love to share all these great stories and these great writers with as many people as we can. So if yes. you don't mind doing that, that's really fun. I'm also, I've also been told that um, every click helps support Bill Gates, uh, who apparently is going through a tough time with his divorce. Uh, <laughs> And, and need some help so um i'm not sure i mean that might might be one of those chain things going around but I, you know mm. don't well, don't if, risk it don't risk leaving bill gates hanging click like yeah. and subscribe i believe everything i read on the interwebs yes of course exactly <laughs> and of course you can always catch us on the second thursday of the month so if you don't uh if you if you don't let us help bill and like and subscribe or sign up for the newsletter so there we go i talk good tonight <laughs> yeah words is good jim words is good it's yeah good. i have the same issue yeah well do we have anything else that we might want to worry about for thanksgiving coming up i mean we got the the cutherky out of the way True. right I did, we did promise one more horrific Thanksgiving uh, surprise. Yeah. So this is, <laughs> and this like, is, oh, no. <laughs> uh oh. And this, um, you know, this is if you want to burn off some of those Thanksgiving calories by uh, being chased around your dining room. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh, my. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> the, the, they're being uh, shipped in special on the Nostromo and will be delivered in time for Thanksgiving. And if it bites you, bite it back. Than that, that cooked turkey or whatever that was. Oh, yeah. That was yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's horrible. Yes. Yeah. That was terrible. You mean this? <laughs> no. That's my favorite. I'm a Kraken <laughs> fan, though. I can't help it. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Lee Murray points out the Pilgrims did not make it quite as far south as New Zealand. So, uh, yeah. That's true. But, but hey, we're trending. Hashtag help Bill Gates. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. Oh, um, and ne next month, uh, our December Galactic Terrors. We have, we have actually a very special program. This is something I teased back in, I think, September. I've been trying to work out all the details for this. Um, and we're going to have a special presentation. Uh, our readers on December 9th will be Sephira Garan, Tim Wagoner, and we've been able to assemble uh, a recording of a reading Lisa Manetti did in 2016 for Halloween with uh, the HWA NY Chapters Morbid Anatomy Museum Night of Readings. Uh, and for those of you who may not know, Lisa passed away, I think, in August. Uh, it was very sad. Um, she is, uh, she was a big part of, you know, our New York chapter. Uh, she was a fantastically talented writer and we've got this wonderful reading, uh, of her that we recorded one of her Lizzie Borden stories. Uh, and it's going to be terrific. Uh, so we're going to feature that in December to kind of end the year with, uh, with something special. Uh, and we hope you'll join us. 
I hope so. Yeah. Well, this has been an awful lot of fun. I, I enjoyed hearing the stories from all three of you and chatting with you. And Jim, it's nice to see you as always. So. Yeah, it's great to be here. Um, we, Carol and I took a couple of months where we swapped with co-hosts so we could actually participate in the reading. Mm -hmm. So this is our first session back uh, together. In our, um, our regular roles, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah it's very um, fun. So do, is there anything else you, you would like to say to uh, to our viewers before we, we close out for the night? Thanks for being here. <laughs> Thank you for coming, yes. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And let's great, also give great a show. Yeah, thank you. We appreciate being here. Let's also give a special thank you to Lou Rera, who does our cool videos yeah. for the intros and the uh, the author intros as well. You know, that's terrific. He makes us look very good. And a special thanks also to Jim Chambers, who is the man behind the curtain while all this is going on. He's pulling all the levers and pushing the buttons and, you know, gearing up the steam engine to make this thing work. So good job, Jim. Thank that's you. Any, any bumps in the road are purely my fault. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but thank you, Gwendolyn, Garrett, and April. We really appreciate having you on uh, and sharing your work with us. And with that, we will say good night, and uh, everyone have a great, uh, a great rest of your evening or afternoon, good wherever night. you are. Wherever you are, and thanks to all our readers for coming, our, our audience. Be for well. Coming.